please pray with me. For all the saints from whom their labors rest, all who by faith before the world confessed, your name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Grace Charles Singleton, Sr. William Arthur. Melvin Shorty Hyman. Robert Brinsma. Mary Lamley, Carolyn Madden, Yuta Garrard, Ruth Evans, Marie Kripe, Betty Reed, Our text today says, These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Those that I just named are the sainted in Christ. Those who have passed from this life and have gone on to the next during this past year. Our observance of All Saints Day is a time when we think about those faithful departed who have gone before us to live with Jesus. Ever since the third century, Christians have gathered together for a special day to remember and to give thanks to God for those who have won the victory by faith in Christ Jesus. But as we know from this text today, the church, ever since its very beginning, has been remembering the saints, those who have died in the faith, and those saints who make up a part of the church today, those who have gone on to live in the eternal church triumphant, and those like you and I who are gathered in this place today who continue to live in the church militant. And so as we remember those saints who are in heaven now in the church triumphant, we should also remember that the bottom line issues of, of life and of death and of salvation are relevant for us right here today and right now today. Beloved member of Bethlehem, Joy Collins, passed from this life to the next on August 13th, 2011. And not long before she died, Joy said to me, Pastor, I'll never forget one of the sermons that you preach, preached. And I was uh, kind of excited about that because pastors aren't used to hearing that somebody actually remembered one of the sermons. <laughs> and I said, well, really, what, uh, what was that? What sermon was it? And she says, well, before I tell you that, she said, I want, you to tell, I want to tell you that actually I remember that sermon every day. And now my ears really picked up. And she said, you prayed a prayer in your sermon. You said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I responded to joy. I said, everybody knows that 
that chair. It's been a prayer. It's been, it's been prayed as a children's prayer for many, many years. And she said, oh, yes, indeed, Pastor. But then you added the words, and if I should wake before I die, I pray thee, Lord, to show me why. She said, I pray that prayer every morning when I wake up and I ask God to show me why he has given me a new day to live for him. Why he has given me another day to live my life under his grace. Why he has given me yet another day to live as one of his children here on this side of heaven. Why has God given this to me? Lord, show me why. Show me why, show me how I can live as your child today. Show me how I can confess your holy name. Show me how I can be a witness in this world. How about you? What do you say when you wake up in the morning? You wake up and say, good morning, Lord. Thank you for giving me another day. Do you wake up like... Luther said we should wake up and every morning confess our sins, know that they are drowned in the waters of baptism, and then rise up as a new man or a new woman, a very child of God, to live for him because you are a saint in Christ Jesus. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, clothed in his righteousness, to now live for him. Do you wake up in the morning like that, or you do you wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning? Or do you say, good morning, Lord? What do you have in store for me today? How can I live for you? You see, we don't become saints when we die. We are saints already because of faith. Our text is so clear about that. Our, our sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It was Christ Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, without spot or wrinkle or any kind of blemish. It's an amazing thing, this, this great reversal that you see throughout Scripture that here we are the ones who, who, are, who are full of sin and Christ takes on that sin himself and gives us forgiveness. We are darkened in sin and, then, and, and Christ takes on that sin and gives us these white robes of, of righteousness. We are dead, and he instead becomes death for us and gives us his life. That's the gospel. It's this incredible thing how Jesus literally turns the world upside down. St. Augustine said that, 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 that we all come before God with empty hands, that God gives to empty hands. We come and we give nothing. I have nothing to give. I'm a dead man walking. The Bible says I am dead. I am lost in trespasses and sin. I bring nothing, and yet Jesus gives me everything. Because he cares about us, because he loves us. He fills these empty hands. I don't bring anything to him as if to say, oh, Lord, look at me, I'm a saint, and certainly I'm worthy of something in your kingdom. And God takes out his measuring stick and, stick and he says, well, here's where you end up. Here's where you land. God's system of salvation isn't built on brownie points. God's system of salvation is built 100% on what Christ gives to us and 0% on what we give to God. We all come with empty hands and Christ fills those empty hands. Luther put it a little bit differently. He said we all come as beggars. He never turns us away. And here we see another one of those incredible reversals because we come as beggars. We're dressed in beggars' clothing in these, in these filthy rags. And Jesus covers us in these, these perfect robes of, of, of his righteousness and takes on those rags upon himself and dies naked on a cross. We come as beggars and Christ turns us into saints. Just think about that on this All Saints Sunday. St. Paul understood that, and that's why almost in all of his letters, he writes to his churches and he calls the people who were sitting in the pews, who were member, members of those local congregations, he calls them saints. He says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called saints. To the church in Ephesus, he writes, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. 
to the church in Philippi. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. He writes that at the very beginning of his letter to the Philippians. And he looks down upon you and me today, brothers and sisters in Christ, and he says, to all the saints at Bethlehem in Jacksonville Beach, I give you everything. You are mine. I love you. I died for you. I rose for you. I forgive you. Eternal life is yours, and I give thee your empty hands, and I, and I fill them with these gifts. These gifts that extend themselves into all eternity. Because we, as children of God, as those sainted in Christ Jesus, have received all of his gifts. And so we remember, too, that there are blessings of sainthood right here on earth. There are blessings that we have as the saints in Christ. We're given to each other. We are given to each other in this body of Christ. As believers in the church, we're already a communion of saints. We just confess that. We confess it almost every week when we confess the, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. You are the communion of saints. You are the communion of saints. Think about that. Let it sink in and let it change the way you live and the way you think and the way you speak. I mean, just think about it. If we really regarded each other this way, imagine how that could transform our lives if we regarded one another as saints in Christ Jesus. If we saw each other not only as sinners, but also as the saints of God, it might be a little bit more difficult to be angry with one another, to be envious of one another, to gossip about one another, to be slanderous about one another. If the saints in the community and the very congregation and in our homes would treat each other like saints, just think about what kind of witness that would be to the world. Forty-one years ago, in the summer of 1975, I worked at a Christian boys' camp in Tuxedo, North Carolina. Probably never heard of it. It was out in the middle of nowhere. I was about 20, 21 years old. I had been climbing for years. I climbed throughout the Rockies. I had hiked and climbed in the Himalayas. And I had just graduated with a, a two-year degree in natural resource management. And I was known as a, as a rock climber. That's what I loved doing. That's what happens when you're raised in Colorado. But this small camp in Tuxedo, North Carolina, recruited me to... Uh, to help facilitate their, their outdoor education program and to teach young, young men how to hike and how to camp and how to climb. Yes, I did have a past life, believe it or not. But I had Sunday mornings off, and so I would drive to a small LCMS congregation uh, in Henderson, North Carolina. And it... It was one of the most beautiful churches that I have ever seen. It, had, it held maybe a hundred people in it, maybe about as long as this section right here. It was a stone church. It had stained glass windows and there were candles in the, in the windows. But when I walked into that church, I really had, I think, a, a deeper understanding of what the church was all about, that the church really is made up of both the church militant and the church triumphant, about the church militant, those who are alive today, and those who are in the church triumphant, who stand before the throne of grace, singing the praises of him who died for them. And the reason I have this, this wonderful you know, this revelation of this is the church is because when you walked into that church, there was a cemetery outside. There was a cemetery in the front and on the sides and in the back. It went around the whole perimeter of, of, this, of this church. And you walked up on the stone path to go into it. And this was the church. It was a perfect, beautiful image of the church, of the church 
those who are already in heaven, their gravestones right there, and yet the living saints in Christ walking into the church to join together and singing their hymns of praise to their king. Church triumphant, standing before the throne of grace and the church militant who continue on this side of heaven to fight with the sword of the spirit against the principalities and the powers and against the flesh and against this world. I found it interesting that there was no official saint buried there. There wasn't a single tombstone, as far as I could tell, that had the word saint on it. But one could not help but reflect on the resurrection and the twofold nature of the church in this world and the next. The church militant like you and I who are here today, whose faith is strengthened through God's word and sacrament, and the church triumphant where faith is consummated in the heavenly kingdom. In a sense, every Christian congregation, whether it has its own cemetery or not, is made up of the living and the dead of the church who make up the church militant and the saints of the church triumphant who in death lie in their graves awaiting the sound of the trumpet call of Christ when he returns again. And all the graves shall be opened up. And as, as Paul writes in his first letter to the Thessalonians, the dead in Christ shall be raised up first. We, we don't have a cemetery here. We have a columbarium outside, and that too is a good reminder. But let me just tell you that as I look out in the congregation today, I can't help but think about those who are in the church triumphant and who join us today in our singing of hymns and praises. I look down and I see Ruth Evans sitting right where you're sitting, Neil. We had a funeral service this past week and I can't help but look back and see Stephen and Linda, Dennis, and see Betty Reed sitting right back there. I see her there. <laughs> I see Ken and Regina Rogoshevsky sitting back there. I see Dick and Almanette Ford. I see Pete Lofton. I see Hermgard. Oh, I could go on and on because there have been over 200 funerals since I came in the year 2000. But don't get me wrong, when I speak those names, these are words of encouragement. And John, when he writes these words in the seventh chapter of his revelation, he writes these words for our encouragement and for our comfort and our hope. Because he reminds us that no matter what is going on in the world, that his kingdom is not of this world. And that is so important for us to remember that his kingdom is not of this world. That as we enter into this election week, we've got to remember that his kingdom is not of this world and our king is not of this world. And he has already elected each of us, you and me, and those that I just named a couple of minutes ago, he has named each of us as saints in Christ Jesus to live with him in eternity. And he will not forsake us and he will not permit us to lose our faith and hope and he promises soon to conduct us to that glorious citizenship of the church triumphant. This is to be our end, not suffering here on earth, but instead the glory of God and of the Lamb, John writes. And so we celebrate our sainthood through Christ Jesus. Yes, we do. We celebrate our sainthood in Christ Jesus. That's why we're here. And we also remember those saints who have gone before us and whom we will remember and whom we will join sooner or later. For all the saints from whom their labors rest, all who by faith before the world confessed, your name, O oh Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, 
bless communion, fellowship divine. We feebly struggle, they in glory shine. Yet all are one within your grand design. Alleluia, alleluia. May it be so for Jesus' sake. Amen.